Good morning, everybody. I'm Howard Chansky. I'm the chair of the University of Washington Department of Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. Welcome to our April 2022 Grand Rounds. A couple of announcements uh, before we uh, start the program. Uh, the first is a uh, kudo to Eli Bunzel, and this comes from his uh, fellow resident, Jay Yao. Uh, I ran into one of the ED residents and he made the point to tell me that he thought Eli was doing a great job and the ED residents really enjoyed working with Eli. He's a pleasure to work with. Um, so thank you, um, Eli, for that. One other announcement, um, our infectious disease doctors have some good news and bad news on the Omicron front. Um, the bad news is that the number of cases in King County has doubled over approximately the past two weeks. And that's been thought to be due to both um, the new variant and the relaxation of all the um, protective measures um, we've been taking. The good news is the rate of hospitalization, at least uh, uh, to this point, has not increased. Uh, but uh, they did remind us at this meeting that um, when we're in patient care areas, we are supposed to be wearing N95 equivalent masks. And uh, though the rules say when we're not in patient care areas, um, we don't strictly need to be masking. Uh, their recommendation is, is that we still continue to mask uh, and that we not congregate for, for meals. So just a reminder, I think you're all aware that in the department, there have been several people who have uh, been out with varying uh, degrees of severity of COVID. And uh, at UW Medical Center, there were about 40 uh, nurses um, out last week um, with COVID and there are faculty in uh, multiple departments who have also uh, been coming down with it. So just continue to be uh, careful. Uh, with that, we'll, we'll move into our uh, grand rounds. And it's my uh, pleasure today to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Dr. Alexander Higgins, uh, one of our residents who is going to partner with uh, Dr. Matthew Thompson, who is the chief of our orthopedic oncology service and has really done a, a remarkable job um, over the last several years uh, moving our oncology program um, forward in, in some important ways. And they're going to be discussing a risk uh, stratified approach and a safe approach to managing soft tissue sarcomas. Uh, and with that, I'll have uh, Dr. Higgins uh, start off our grand rounds. Great. Can everybody see my screen? Looks good. Awesome. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I have the pleasure to present with Dr. Thompson today on soft tissue sarcoma, safe evaluation, and risk stratified approach to management. Uh, we have no disclosures. Uh, today we will discuss uh, definition, go over epidemiology, discuss presentation, workup, prognosis, and treatment of soft tissue sarcoma. Soft tissue sarcomas are complicated heterogeneous malignancies of the mesenchyme, encompassing at least 100 different histologic and molecular subtypes, each displaying variable clinical behavior. There are approximately 13,000 new cases in the year, uh, per year in the United States alone and make up less than 1% of all cancers. 80% of sarcomas occur during childhood. However, they vary based on age with certain sarcomas having a higher incidence in select age groups. For example, liposarcoma can occur in older patients, epithelioid sarcoma and synovial sarcoma occur in young adults and rhabdomyosarcoma in children. Sarcomas usually present as non-tender, firm, and well-circumscribed masses of the extremity. Most sarcomas develop in people with no known risk factors. However, biologic and genetic risk factors have been described, such as exposure to external beam radiation, exposure to chemicals such as herbicides, as well as a number of genetic syndromes. 60% of sarcomas occur in the extremity, with the lower extremity being more common than the upper extremity, with the thigh being the most common site. A large, firm, and fixed mass are concerning features and warrant further workup. 
Lastly, these masses can be superficial versus deep with deep tumors more likely to be larger because significant growth may occur before they are noticed by the patient. Synovial sarcoma and epithelial sarcoma as depicted here are two sarcomas that regularly occur in the distal extremities. Workup for soft tissue sarcoma includes imaging, referral, biopsy, and eventual staging, which ultimately helps guide treatment. We'll discuss each of these in detail starting with MRI with contrast. MRI with contrast is currently the imaging modality of choice for soft tissue sarcomas and should be strongly considered before excision of any soft tissue mass larger than two to three centimeters. Low signal intensity on T1 weighted images, high intensity on T2, a heterogeneous appearance and contrast enhancement are MRI features common to soft tissue sarcomas. In addition to this, they may have central necrosis and nodular enhancement. Sarcomas grow centripetally, and the location of the tumor in relation to critical neurovascular or osseous structures should be scrutinized. And imaging that's not diagnostic of a known benign entity, such as lipoma, ganglion, hemangioma, PVNS, or synovial chondromatosis, should warrant further investigation and biopsy. Referral to high volume sarcoma center is paramount if there is concern for soft tissue sarcoma and should be considered if a patient presents with any of the following features, including a superficial soft tissue mass over five centimeters, a deep soft tissue mass, retroperitoneal tumor of any size. Centralization of care at academic centers is important to ensure the feasibility of multi-institutional trials and ultimately enable development of more efficient regimens for the treatment of patients with localized advanced soft tissue sarcoma. The importance of referring to high volume sarcoma center has been reported in the literature. In an analysis of 1100 patients with retroperitoneal sarcoma, Kung et al reported that patients treated at high volume centers had lower 30 day readmission, lower 30 day and 90 day mortality and longer median and five year overall survival. These findings have also recently been documented in France, where a study of 35,000 patients found that those treated at specialized sarcoma referral centers have had a reduction in the risk of local relapse, progression, and death. This is in part affected by a lack of experience, resources, and complications of performing a biopsy. In a multi-center study by Mankin, which included 25 surgeons from 21 institutions, found that error complications and changes in the course and outcome were two to 12 times greater when the biopsy was done in a referring institution instead of a treatment center. Principles of biopsies include incision planning, which is generally longitudinal, as well as placing the incision with the biopsy track in line with the utilitarian uh, uh, incision. Additionally, traversing a single compartment, ensuring meticulous hemostasis, refraining from using an ESMARC and placing a drain in line and distal are important for performing a safe biopsy. The pictures here represent on the left, a high grade UPS excised in a primary cares office through a transverse incision that resulted in a massive hematoma and ecchymosis throughout the ankle and foot that eventually led to a blown knee amputation. On the right, a Ewing sarcoma that was partially excised through a 10 centimeter transverse incision that was subsequently aborted after being found to invade bone. We treated with a total humeral replacement, reverse total shoulder, and TEA and a large myocutaneous flap after neoadjuvant chemotherapy and radiation treatment. Principles of staging include figuring out if the soft tissue sarcoma has spread, and if so, how far. Local staging assesses the extent of the primary tumor mass and gives information on its resectability. The most useful imaging modality for local staging is going to be that MRI. Systemic staging assesses metastatic disease and can be delayed until after a biopsy has confirmed the diagnosis and includes chest imaging with the consideration of additional staged staging based on subtype and context. Furthermore, staging of soft tissue sarcomas includes that CT chest and typically a bone scan to evaluate first and second most common sites of metastasis. SCARE and RACE are acronyms that represent sarcomas with a predilection of extrapulmonary metastasis to lymph nodes and bone respectively. 
failure to identify extra pulmonary metastatic disease is associated with poor survival outcomes and misinformed prognosis and may alter treatment. The American Joint Committee of Cancer created a staging system, the TNM staging system, which is based on four key pieces of information. The extent of the tumor, how large is the cancer, the spread, of the, the spread to nearby lymph nodes, the spread to distant sites, the grade of the cancer, or how much do the sarcoma cells look like normal cells uh, on histology. The grade of the sarcoma helps predict how rapidly it will grow and spread. And there's three subcategories, which include differentiation, mitotic count, and tumor necrosis. As far as prognosis, accurate prediction of prognosis in patients with soft tissue sarcoma is a challenging issue because there's extreme variability in the clinical and pathological characteristics of this family of tumors, which hinders the simple stratification uh, of patients into meaningful prognostic cohorts. Precision medicine tools for the prediction of prognosis, prognosis such as nomograms, enable personalized computation of outcome based on clinical and pathologic characteristics of both patient and tumor. The Sarcolator is an online nomogram that predicts the overall survival of patients with resected primary extremity and trunk sarcomas mostly created using European data from patients treated at high volume sarcoma centers. I'll briefly touch about treatment. The treatment of high grade soft tissue sarcoma often involves a combination of surgery and radiation. Radiation has shown, been shown to facilitate local control in the management of soft tissue sarcomas and combined with wide local excision has prevented the need for amputation in most patients. High energy particles or waves are used to destroy and are damaged cancer cells, which cause small breaks in DNA and fast dividing cancer cells, slowing or preventing growth and division. Preoperative versus postoperative radiation remains controversial. With preoperative radiation has the advantage of treating a well oxygenated smaller bed. This allows administration of a lower dose of radiation 50 gray to a smaller tissue volume. When radiation is used in a hypoxic post-operative bed, the dose of radiation is much higher, sometimes 60 grays or larger, and the field size is larger. However, both can lead to complications of wound healing and fibrosis. That concludes uh, my part of the presentation. I'll turn it over to Dr. Thompson, who will discuss more about treatment. Great. Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, it was, it's an honor to present with you this morning. Thanks for asking me to, to, to help out with this. Um, um, and thanks, Dr. Chansky, for the introduction. Um, as you mentioned, I'm, my name is Matt Thompson. I'm one of the orthopedic oncologists at SCCA. So I, thought, I think Dr. Al, Dr. Higgins did a really good job of introducing um, effectively the sort of requisite and salient knowledge that the practicing non-oncologic orthopedic surgeon uh, can employ on a daily basis to first recognize the potential for soft tissue sarcoma and then to safely initiate an appropriate workup, avoiding whoops procedures or non-oncologic excisions or contaminated resections, and then um, facilitate an optimal outcome for the patient by timely referral to the tertiary care center. To try to build on that just a little bit, I'll try to expand on some of the nuances and controversies that surround treating soft tissue sarcoma in the current era. I'll discuss some of the surgical decision-making that goes into um, trying to make the right choice for our patients. We'll discuss some of the most common complications of treatment and then try to build on Dr. Higgins' discussion of uh, subtype specific staging workup um, with review of our post treatment surveillance, for, excuse me, surveillance plan, assuming that we have time to do that. So, as Dr. Higgins introduced, in general, the majority of soft tissue sarcoma should be treated with a multimodal treatment strategy incorporating radiation and wide local excision. There are certain contexts for rare subtypes of soft tissue sarcoma where chemotherapy may not only be an integral component of of uh, treatment, but also considered standard of care. Uh, but it's also used in situations where we're trying to risk reduce uh, systemic disease when the inherent risks of such are high. But in large part, these chemotherapy in the adult sarcoma practice is most prevalent among patients with metastatic disease and is used with a palliative intent. 
I should start out by saying that this slide is not uh, proportionate to the incidence of these individual treatment regimens, but is rather just intended to try to offer a, a visual um, organization of the different types of approach to treatment for soft tissue sarcoma. In general, radiation and surgery are the cornerstones of treatment, but there are circumstances when certain low-grade superficial soft tissue sarcomas that are small in size can be treated with surgery alone. For example, dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans or a low-grade cutaneous lyomyosarcoma. Um, or low-grade mixolipo-sarcoma. And I would say controversially, there are actually some and several uh, publications that advocate for uh, this approach, even with high-grade uh, soft tissue sarcoma that is small and superficial, when a radical margin can be achieved. I think that's controversial, and we'll go into that just a little bit further. Um, however, in general, it, really any soft tissue that is intermediate grade or higher, deep to the fascia or greater than five centimeters, should receive either pre- or post-operative radiation. And this, I think, relates to the point that many of the most prevalent forms of soft tissue sarcoma in the adult population are considered chemoinsensitive or don't exhibit a positive effect or tumor necrosis when exposed to chemotherapy. Radiation might also be considered in contexts other than these. For example, if you're treating a low-grade tumor that has recurred or that is presenting in a very difficult anatomic location, where the risk of a recurrence or the morbidity of treating a recurrence would be greater than if radiation were included in the initial treatment. And then the third group of uh, tumors fed into the chemotherapy and surgery or chemotherapy plus radiation and surgery treatment um, arms. And um, for certain soft tissue sarcomas like uh, embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma, zinc sarcoma, and Ewing sarcoma, Treatment may consist purely of chemotherapy and surgery, and that chemotherapy regimen typically is um, um, vincristine, adriamycin, and, and cyclophosphamide, alternating with ifosfamide and etoposide. Um, but the more common regimen, again, in the adult population is, is AIM, adriamycin, and doxorubicin with ifosfamide and mesna. Um, and in this context, radiation is also included in treatment. So typically this, these are patients who receive the triple threat or chemotherapy, radiation, followed by a wide surgical excision. Um, to try to drill down just a little bit on the evidence surrounding chemotherapy, because it's a controversial topic and one that we um, uh, discuss often. Um, the evidence uh, for and against chemotherapy um, I guess I'm hoping there are no medical oncologists in the audience uh, to watch me simplify hours of potential uh, very cerebral debate um, for me to condense that into one slide. But I think that for, the, for most orthopedic surgeons, the current state can really be summarized in just a few slides. And I'll start by saying that biologic heterogeneity, as Dr. Higgins mentioned, in heterogeneous patient populations that span the lifespan in terms of age, uh, make it very difficult to perform high quality studies. And so, some of the larger studies have shown negative results related to chemotherapy in the new adjuvant and adjuvant setting, but some smaller studies have shown potential for at least a delay in development of distant and or locally recurrent disease in high-risk patients. There's only, a, only one trial that I'm aware of that compares directly neoadjuvant chemotherapy plus surgery to primary surgery alone. And in that trial, no difference in disease-free or overall survival was demonstrated in 150 patients with uh, so-called high-risk soft tissue sarcoma, so high-grade subfascial and greater than five centimeters. Critics of that study would say that it was underpowered um, and inappropriate and used an inappropriate uh, drug regimen. Um, and then also, as Dr. Higgins introduced, we, we have a new tool called the Circulator app, which is a, a risk calculator that takes into account the patient's age, tumor size, subtype, and grade and gives us five and 10 year um, risk of distant metastatic disease and overall survival. And some recent work has shown that this may actually help us risk stratify patients to groups of patients who may benefit from, from chemotherapy and who may not, um, such that a predicted overall survival at five years, less than 60% is being used by some centers to justify the use of uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy. But if I could summarize it down into one statement, I would say that the perioperative use of chemotherapy trends toward about a 5% risk or 5% survival benefit when you consider all comers for soft tissue sar for high grade soft tissue sarcoma. And it's for these reasons that the use of chemotherapy is really limited to those tumors which there is a clear risk reduction that's been established, or for contexts in which we're treating a tumor that we know is relatively chemosensitive and, and, um, and any amount of surgical downstaging uh, could impact either the patient's survival or uh, facilitate a more appealing surgical intervention. 
So perhaps with time, we'll see more in the way of external validation of these studies using tools like the Circulator app to um, facilitate our decision-making paradigms um, and potentially with more selective um, patient selection, um, a more positive impact for chemotherapy in specific contexts will be uncovered, but uh, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. I think there are other potentials. Uh, maybe we'll find a way other than um, than the Sarclator app to identify patients who may benefit from systemic chemotherapy using what I would say is maybe a more empirical approach. The images on the slide are from a, a study we were lucky enough to be a part of. It was a multi-center investigation where the premise was that soft tissue sarcoma, because of its heterogeneity, um, composed of up to 120 subtypes, depending on how you parse them out, presenting in an equally heterogeneous population of hosts, um, that it may be unrealistic to expect that in, at any time in the near future, specific molecular alterations um, will exert a meaningful impact on so-called uh, precision medicine or, or patient-targeted, patient-specific treatment. So the question this study asked was, is there a more pragmatic solution? Uh, can we simply inject these tumors with microdoses of the most commonly used chemotherapeutic agents for soft tissue sarcoma at the time of presentation or right before biopsy, and then include that part of the tumor in an open excision or open incisional biopsy, and then use sophisticated uh, automated histologic techniques to quantify the amount of apoptosis or cell death uh, related to each injected agent, and then thereby guide um, treatment based on the results of this uh, preoperative biopsy. So I think this is a, an, an exciting idea. It, it, it um, asks a very practical question. And how is this specific tumor going to respond in situ in the tumor microenvironment in this particular patient to the treatments that we have at hand and potentially use that to, to, to select the appropriate agent for a given patient? I mentioned earlier that surgery alone is considered by some to be an acceptable treatment for some high-grade sarcomas, but as I'll go into here, it's not something that we typically uh, are comfortable with here. Um, there have been multiple uh, retrospective studies uh, that demonstrated that select high-grade touch tissue sarcomas can be safely treated in this manner, while others associate um, surgery monotherapy with a higher risk of local recurrence. Um, and I think really the question may be that what, what, what really constitutes a wide resection margin or, or what is an adequate surgery? And does the zone of peritumoral edema help to accurately define it? So in other words, can we look at an MRI and clearly define the extent of the tumor and thereby um, establish our surgical uh, treatment goals? The paper on the slide is an, kind of an interesting work uh, from the, uh, I believe this is out of Toronto. Um, where they looked at 15 soft tissue sarcomas and they compared preoperative MRI and in 10 of 15 samples, uh, they found satellite cells that, ex that existed outside uh, the tumor cell or outside the tumor itself. And in four of those cases, they found satellite cells up or over one centimeter uh, from the main tumor, sort of nullifying the generally acceptable safe margin for soft tissue sarcoma, especially in the area uh, in the era of radiation therapy and accepting closer margins. But they also identified cells existing up to a maximum of four centimeters away from the tumor. And while a four centimeter margin in the sagittal plane uh, may seem pretty plausible, uh, in the axial plane, obtaining a four centimeter margin, if not possible, could be extremely debilitating in terms of the amount of tissue that would have to be removed to achieve that. So surgery alone for a high grade soft tissue sarcoma, playing the odds uh, in the right circumstance might be okay, but because of this, potential for biologic aberrancy or, or aggressive uh, satellite cells escaping the tumor, I would personally be uncomfortable with approaching high-grade soft tissue sarcoma alone without, um, without radiation. Um, further, the study showed that the peritumoral changes, T2 hyperintensity and enhancement surrounding the primary tumor itself did not predict the presence or distribution of, of satellite cells. Um, and so if you think about this practically and consider the incidence of local recurrence rates in the pre and post radiation treatment eras, I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, with, a, with effective radiation therapy in the current era, we can accept very close margins up to about a, a millimeter, or now we will even say a negative margin, uh, whether it's within a millimeter or not. 
even though we know these satellite cells exist. And so we think that radiation effectively um, uh, kills these cells, allowing us to accept a very close margin on the primary tumor when, when we have to. Um, whereas in the era prior to radiation therapy, um, when we're not able to form a very radical resection, the risk of recurrence uh, with surgery alone was higher. So why not use radiation for all soft tissue sarcoma? And it's really about the biologic or potential for biologic aberrancy of the, of the tumor in these, in these satellite cells or early metastatic disease. Um, the risk of um, local recurrence for a low grade um, or grade one um, soft tissue sarcoma treated with limb salvage is, around, is less than 20% and the risk of metastatic disease is quite low. Um, and so because of the fact that radiation has side effects, um, especially in situations where patients are projected to live longer after recovering from radiation, there's a greater chance of these side effects becoming significant to their survival. And so even though it's an important tool, we try not to use it if it can be avoided due to morbidity. I'll say again, radiation is a part of curative limb salvage treatment of a potentially devastating or life-threatening cancer. And it really is a game changer in many ways, but as a surgeon, um, I really don't like radiation therapy. Uh, you know, I have my days. Um, it causes fibrosis, it obscures anatomic planes, and in general can make resection time more consuming as we try to develop planes and protect critical anatomy while, res while resecting pretty massive tumors. And of course, the picture on the right is sort of the last thing you want to see on, at 4.30 on Friday afternoon. Um, but, uh, you know, you have to ask yourself, is this an acute radiation reaction or is this a surgical site infection? If it's a surgical site infection, we really should act now and not not wait for that to be parsed out. Um, and so the use of pre-operative pre radiation versus post-operative radiation, radiation remains controversial. I think that mostly relates to this, this picture on the right here, the risk of wound healing complications or infection when radiation is given before surgery. Um, because of the reasons you mentioned, or the reasons that Dr. Higgins mentioned, we can use a smaller dose and more targeted radiation. And so at our center, we do tend to try to use radiation in the preoperative setting. And we just accept the fact that the sarcoma is not treated until the wound's healed and, and we've gotten the patient through um, short intermediate term follow-up without an infection. We can treat an infection and chances are actually 80 to 90% of the patient won't experience an infection. But if it happens, we'll, we'll, we'll get through that. The most important thing is we're prioritizing uh, complete kill and removal of the, of the life-threatening disease. Other complications from radiation include fibrosis, joint stiffness, risk of radiation-associated fracture as well as the most devastating secondary sarcoma. The risk of radiation-associated fracture may be less with a more targeted uh, delivery technique, such as IMRT, uh, where a lower dose can be administered to the adjacent bony anatomy without affecting the treatment dose at the tumor. But if a fracture is likely to occur, it can be a very devastating injury requiring augmented fixation because uh, after a bone has been irradiated, it, it effectively lacks the biology to heal. And so our load sharing devices ultimately become load bearing devices and over time fatigue and can fail. And so these are situations where you might use an augmented fixation construct or potentially augment with bone cement. Um, because if a fracture happens, um, um, fracture healing potential is low and we may have to resort to a more invasive um, reconstructive technique such as an intercalated prosthesis or perhaps a prevascularized fibular graft in the right, in the right patient. We try our best to identify those patients who are at the highest risk. So in general, patients who are older, female, treated with doses over 60 gray and a weight-bearing bone um, to a high treatment volume, and especially in contexts where we have to resect a large portion of the anterior uh, compartment of the thigh or perform a significant amount of periosteal stripping, we might consider prophylactic fixation. I personally don't do that at the time of the index resection, preferring a clean surgical field and minimizing the risk of contamination. But we'll come back and do that at a later time um, because that risk of fracture is not immediate. Post-radiation post sarcoma, though, is clearly the most devastating potential complication from radiation. Um, and as a secondary sarcoma, it typically occurs around 10 years or more after radiation exposure within the field of, of radiation. And tumors that present in this context have a very aggressive behavior and, and overall poor prognosis. On the top left is a picture of a patient who we treated for a desmoid tumor, of the, or we didn't treat, but she was treated for a desmoid tumor of the obturator notch about 20 years prior to presentation. She was treated with radiation and surgery. She then developed a high-grade spindle cell sarcoma within the radiation field. They were actually able to resect with a, a widely negative margin. This is a pelvic resection with a tumor 
exhibiting extrosis extension from the, um, uh, or I should say invasion into the ischial ramus um, and kind of encroaching on the uh, obturator foramen or what was left of it and the sciatic nerve. And so despite this being a pelvic resection, we're able to achieve a, a one centimeter margin, which is uh, great. Um, however, due to the inherent biology of the tumor, she wanted to develop widespread local and distant metastatic disease within about six months of treatment. So she exposed herself to a lot of risk after being completely informed um, and morbidity from surgery and a long recovery only to experience metastatic disease um, shortly thereafter. For that, for, for that and other reasons, when I treat a pelvic sarcoma, especially in the setting of radiation associated sarcoma, I really reflect on two cases, the one we just presented in, in this case. Um, this patient also presented with a radiation associated sarcoma in the obturator notch. Uh, after a complete informed consent process, he uh, elected for minimally or for a maximally invasive attempt at cure. He accepted a very poor two year survival prognosis uh, in an attempt at cure. Um, his prognosis is actually worse numerically than the prior patient uh, based on the numbers. Risk of a bladder injury, flail hip, and a prolonged recovery. And he did so for any chance that he could try to facilitate to walk his water, his daughter down the aisle. She was getting married uh, the following spring. The wedding was delayed, which helped because he wasn't quite ambulating yet at that point. But uh, three years post-treatment, he's alive without disease and, and was able to accomplish his goal. Um, so I guess we have to rely on probabilities and, and statistics in these settings to, to provide our patients with the hope of you know, informed decision-making and understanding that we cannot fully illustrate um, really either outcome completely, whether operative or non-operative treatment is chosen um, at the time that the, that the decision has to be made. But with honesty and compassion, we can speak to what is possible, what is probable, and then what is rational. And that's really different for every patient and based on their uh, disease, their risk tolerance, and their, and their um, wishes and hopes for the future. So jumping into a little bit into the surgical decision-making, uh, to, to build on that conversation. Amputation, I would say, is always a, a viable option, always an option to consider when treating sarcoma. There's no question that it provides the best oncologic margins, but that can come at a cost depending on um, patient-specific factors and the location of the tumor. So the questions we ask ourselves to try to navigate that decision between amputation and limb salvage or more, more accurately help our patients navigate that decision, uh, will survival be the same? Uh, will amputation or limb salvage result in a better survival or, or um, less risk? How does function compare in this particular patient if an amputation is considered compared to limb salvage? How do immediate and late complications compare? And does limb sparing surgery impart any improved psychosocial or impart any effect on psychosocial outcomes or quality of life? I would say that in a center like ours, we're lucky to uh, encounter very few hard and fast contraindications to, to limb salvage surgery. But in general, if, there, if the tumor involves critical neurovascular structures or more than one bundle or more than one critical nerve for regular ambulatory function, um, amputation may be indicated. If that structure can't be resected and reconstructed with a realistic or reasonable hope uh, for functional recovery. And then with, recon with reconstructive approaches, will the patient's function really be better than amputation? And I think that's especially true in the acral or distal ex extremity. And so a conversation that we navigate often with, with our patients. This is an example of a massive soft tissue sarcoma that we ultimately saw after he'd been partially treated at a few other centers, but wasn't willing to accept four-quarter amputation. Um, this is a hybrid undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, and we're able to resect that with a uh, negative margin. And, um, and then with the assistance of our plastic surgery colleagues perform soft tissue reconstruction that required, as you can see, two flaps and a skin graft. Um, but after being fully informed, he was willing to accept that risk and morbidity um, for a successful treatment outcome and limb preservation. A few years ago, uh, if you Google the terms amputation um, and limb sparing surgery, at least uh, from my desktop uh, browsing history, these are the images that you would see. Um, it's hard, and I think for that reason, it's not hard to understand the cognitive and potential cultural barriers that patients grapple with when facing a decision between limb salvage and amputation. When I was in training, I, you know, I witnessed these conversations with different attendings um, from that um, privileged uh, uh, trainee perspective where you get to see the approach of different providers and, and the uh, impact or receptiveness of different patients. 
And I wondered about the unspoken assumptions that both patients and providers harbored and, and brought to these conversations and how that affected decision-making. Um, I wondered if you showed a picture like this, if the conversation would unfold differently. Um, if you showed patients or patients had a preconceived notion or unspoken assumption about high functioning uh, amputees with current technology prosthetics, would more patients choose the amputation for the simplicity of the operation, the wide radical margin and the, and the lower risk of reoperation lifelong? Um, I, I, I wonder if we showed pictures to patients of complications from limb salvage surgery, uh, if that would also lead to a more balanced discussion of potential um, uh, treatment decisions. Because until you've gone through multiple revisions of your distal femur replacement, it's hard to really um, hard to really understand what that means. I was happy to see that Wikipedia has updated their title uh, photo uh, to a more optimistic one for amputation. Um, and I think every little bit probably helps in the mind of the patient trying to decide what to do. But I think I still grapple with this. How do I affect the cognitive biases that impact patient decision-making? Uh, we tried to do a, a study. Uh, we tried to observe, and uh, we did observe weak effects of artificially inserted cognitive bias into a simulated virtual patient's decision when deciding between limb salvage and amputation. And though our observations were groundbreaking in this study uh, and were prone to other types of, of bias, Perhaps we mostly learned the bandwidth that it takes to complete uh, and care a carefully designed study of this nature that really answers the questions that we're after. Um, but I think what got the most attention when we presented this paper at our national conferences was just the um, um, number of patients, number of simulated virtual patients who chose amputation, uh, regardless of whether or not we were inserting cognitive bias or not. I think that was a surprise to a lot of the providers uh, from around the country who saw the abstract. In general, as Dr. Higgins mentioned, limb salvage surgery is the, uh, you can call it the standard of care for treating soft tissue sarcoma. Um, our indications are that we need to be able to achieve an adequate surgical margin. We need to accept, we need an acceptable functional and cosmetic outcome and an acceptable risk of complications. And again, relative contraindications are relative and, and um, uh, in order to pursue limb salvage, you should be able to provide the patient with a functioning limb that facilitates their quality of life. Um, and if the neurovascular structures are encased, if they can't be recycled and reconstructed, then limb salvage probably is not the best option. Um, the femoral nerve is especially important to the gait, but uh, I would challenge some of these paradigms as we've, we have several patients who have been treated with either anterior compartment resection or femoral nerve resection with limb salvage who managed to ambulate uh, very effectively um, on uneven surfaces. Um, whereas a cytic nerve palsy is pretty well tolerated. Uh, historically, the femoral nerve is one that we would recommend against limb salvage for uh, historically if it had to be resected. But again, I would, I would challenge that paradigm just based on experiences with specific patients. So um, try, I'm going to try to just jump into the uh, discussion of surgical margins and how that should impact our treatment planning. Um, I think that um, um, Dr. Uh, Jay Wonders uh, uh, canon of, of publications regarding the surgical margin is one that I go to often. It's very helpful and it it's very, uh, provides a very pragmatic perspective on treating high-grade soft tissue sarcomas in difficult anatomic areas in, in an academic center like ours. Um, the historical R, R0 classification classified tumors with a microscopically negative margin as R0, a microscopically positive margin as R1, and a grossly positive margin or the tumor has been transected as, as R2. The R plus one classification was, was recommended and this redesignates R0 as any situation in which the tumor exists greater than one millimeter from the specimen's edge. Whereas an R1 is considered when the tumor does not involve the margin but is less than one millimeter from the ink surface. And an R2 represents again a grossly positive margin. This classification system effectively reduces the differences in local recurrence rates between R1 and R0 and can be used to suggest that margins that are microscopically negative, but even less than one millimeter to the specimen edge um, may be acceptable when a wider margin can't be achieved when we're trying to preserve critical anatomy. And so this comes as a, kind of a surprise. We've all been told that soft tissue sarcoma should be treated with a wide radical margin, but the reality is soft tissue sarcomas present in deep anatomic areas next to critical structures. And, and it's 
maybe the minority of time when we actually achieve a one centimeter margin in all directions, but we can very often, most of the time, achieve a, a negative margin. Thanks to radiation therapy, that's uh, acceptable. We know that vessel adventitia, epineurin, and periosteum uh, can be accepted as close and safe margins. We also know that resection of vessels, for example, the common femoral artery and vein, even with reconstruction, results in significant complications and morbidity, including lymphedema. Um, but perhaps the most um, significant work uh, from, again, the group in Toronto, uh, in my opinion, uh, investigated the, the situation where you're planning a very close margin and ultimately that, that margin comes back as microscopically positive along a critical structure. How does that affect outcome? The local recurrence free survival is clearly impacted. The risk of a positive margin along a critical structure um, results in about a 15% risk of local recurrence compared to about a 3% um, when a neg negative margin is achieved. But I think more importantly, when you look at the absolute difference between risk of local recurrence between a positive margin and a negative margin achieved through resection of that critical structure, there's not that much of a difference, only, uh, only a few percentage points. And more importantly, when you go ahead and look at five-year overall survival, in a planned close and ultimately negative margin situation, the five-year survival is 80%. That drops to around 60% when the margin is microscopically positive on that critical structure. But importantly, if the vessel is resected because it's encased and reconstructed and you achieve a negative margin, the risk of five-year overall survival is only about 3% greater based on this study. And so perhaps the message here is that aggressive tumor biology is associated with a higher risk of metastatic disease and also more aggressive growth that doesn't um, respect soft tissue planes. And I think that's kind of the center point for accepting close margins in the right scenario. Um, in the interest of uh, time, I'll, I won't go into great detail on this, but this looks at the um, a different situation. So. The previous slide discussed an intentional, close, and potentially even microscopically positive margin that was planned and, and executed in a controlled manner, which is different than the inadvertent positive margin. Inadvertent positive margins can be related to surg surgical factors um, uh, and or tumor factors. But importantly, if an inadvertent positive mar margin is encountered, that is associated with a higher local recurrence, um, and lower overall survival. And there are no in there are no between group differences between whether or not that was a surgical or tumor related factor that resulted in the inadvertent positive margin. I think the other unfortunate reality about treating soft tissue sarcoma in our practice is that around 30 to 40 percent of our patients have already been treated. Um, unplanned excision of soft tissue sarcoma increases the risk of local recurrence despite re-excision and radiation. So we still bring our absolute best to these patients with radiation and a radical in block tumor bed excision but we know that our, the patient is inherently already affected by that initial whoops procedure. Um, so despite my, I, I, I would, um, despite the caution or the, the endorsement of accepting close margins when possible, there are also situations where it's not possible. So this is a patient who has had a high grade synovial sarcoma that sort of encased the common femoral artery and vein at the bifurcation. She'd already undergone an incomplete excision. So she was treated with um, radiation uh, preoperatively followed by a, a radical uh, resection where we resected a, about a 10 centimeter segment of the CFA, SFA, and the very proximal part of the PFA. Our vascular surgery colleagues performed a, a saphenous um, vein graft uh, bypass uh, at the bifurcation, reconstructing both vessels and then an abdominal flap for coverage of that reconstruction. So a lot of our cases, in order to achieve the best outcome for our patients while preserving function and, and minimizing risk of oncologic recurrence come from collaborative surgery. And so um, we know very well and appreciate the expertise and, and collaboration of our plastic surgeons, vascular surgeons, and on, and on down the list. This is an example of a massive periscapular sarcoma treated with the latissimus flap. Um, the greatest opportunity for overlap and collaboration is uh, sacral tumors. And so this is just a, a, a dissection of the left pudendal uh, nerve uh, from S3 um, uh, distally down to the sacral tuberous ligament as it enters Alcox Canal. And that's the center point of maybe the amount of multidisciplinary involvement that we need in these cases. Um, 
obviously if that structure can't be preserved bilaterally or even in cases where a portion of it can, we have to involve our colorectal surgery colleagues for ostomies and the like. So patient treated with um, treated for MPNST of the S2 nerve root. Um, we performed a pretty involved hemispherectomy through an anterior and posterior approach, double barrel free vascular fibular grafts and lumbopelvic fixation. So that included no less than five teams of, of surgeons trying to get the best outcome that we can for our patient. <laughs> Once we've completed uh, treatment, uh, we enter a phase of surveillance. And I would say that if anything, surveillance is uh, again, controversial. Um, in general, we want to look for the risk. We want to assess for uh, uh, development of metastatic disease, dis disease distant to the site, and also local disease. Um, the NCCN guidelines leave it pretty wide open, but in general, for a high risk or a high grade soft tissue sarcoma, our paradigm is to see that patient every four months for the first two to three years after treatment, and then every six months, and then yearly through year 10. Um, and included in that surveillance is chest imaging, so typically a CT of the chest for all soft tissue sarcomas, alternating with a simple chest x-ray. And then whether or not to, to include local surveillance um, uh, to the surgical site uh, with MRI is, again, quite debatable. Um, and I'll just say, if I can summarize, there are um, uh, there's significant evidence to say that MRI doesn't make an impact. It doesn't lead to an increased lead time. It uncovers tumors of the same size that clinical exam does and it doesn't affect natural history. Um, but other studies have shown that the uh, lead time is greater, so you identify a recurrence sooner. Um, but the, um, the reality is that we also uncover a lot of false positives and that impacts patient's experience dramatically. The anxiety of being worked up for or surveilled over the course of several months for an incidental finding or an inconclusive finding on MRI is very stressful for patients um, and difficult to navigate. And so we. I try, at least try to be selective in my local surveillance paradigm um, and try to identify those situations where there is a high risk of local recurrence for treating aggressive biology, mixofibrous sarcoma or UPS with an infiltrative growth pattern. We're treating a, a whoops surgery. We've, uh, there's already been a positive margin resection or we've had to accept a close and ultimately microscopically positive margin. Or if the tumor's in a, tumor was in a location where it's difficult to examine, so subjacent to a flap um, or other anatomic factors like a pelvic tumor. Um, and then we didn't go into in great detail, maybe it's beyond the scope of this talk, but for certain subtypes of sarcoma, as Dr. Higgins mentioned, the ESARC or the SCARE mnemonic, um, extra pulmonary metastatic disease may be more common, it's still rare. Um, and as I mentioned, scanning the entire body, doing uh, things like uh, PET scanning and whole body MRI, you just count on incidental findings. and 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 it can be discouraging the number of times we end up with a um, invasive workup resulting from that that ultimately turns out to be negative. I would never be disparaging toward our radiation colleagues who we rely on greatly and greatly appreciate their, their help and collaboration. They're in a, in a room looking at a screen and they have to call these findings out. I totally understand, but it, uh, especially in the era of transparent medical records with their patients, I don't think one can underestimate the, the psychological uh, impacts this can have on our patients and their experience um, as they have ready access to these results the minute that they're, the minute that they're saved to the chart. And so I, again, just try to be selective um, and counsel our patients about the risks, not only of metastatic disease and our ability to detect that with our chosen surveillance paradigm, but also talk to them about the chance about the chance for false positives and the chance that we'll be in a situation where we may have to do additional work to confirm um, or refute that the tumor has recurred or become metastatic. I think the discussion probably would not be incomplete if it weren't if it didn't include the potential financial impact of, of um, this type of treatment or surveillance paradigm where we're scanning the entire body for um, a potentially low risk of uh, metastatic disease. And so I think I'll stop there rather than digging into that conversation any further. I don't think we have time. So maybe we can stop there and ask if there are any questions. Yeah, Matt, um, Matt and, and Alex, that was fantastic. And uh, thank you for the nice introduction, Alex. And, and uh, Dr. Thompson, I think that uh, ref your talk reflects the thoughtfulness, uh, 
scientifically based and and uh, very logical approach that you've uh, brought to us for these uh, complex patients. I'll start off with a very basic question, which goes back to the beginning of the the talk, um, and and maybe also goes back to the slide uh, that you uh, showed with the risks of tumor bed reexcision and and even reexcision with um, adjuvant therapy. Uh, leaves the patients um, at much higher risk for uh, local and and uh, distant recurrence, and that is what what does the orthopedic surgeon who's not trained in oncology do uh, in the common scenario where a patient comes to them uh, with a new uh, lump or bump? What are the criteria? If you could just simplify them for you know, what you think um, they can take care of, if any, and what should be referred uh, to an a orthopedic oncologist. Yeah, I think Alex uh, said it well, Dr. Higgins, do you wanna? You wanna go over that, Alex? Yeah, definitely. So I think um, uh, characteristics that would require a referral to uh, orthopedic oncologist that's at a, a sarcoma center would be if the mass is a superficial mass greater than five centimeters, if it's deep, um, if it's uh, fixed, any retroperitoneal uh, tumor of any size. Um, so I think that the general orthopedist needs to have a high clinical suspicion of, of sarcoma and treat any mass as sort of, you know, possibly sarcoma um, until proven otherwise. And, non, and does not demonstrate diagnostic features of benign entities on MRI once you get that, that imaging. But if there's any concern for any of those characteristic uh, findings on MRI, or if the lesion is large, fixed, firm, uh, slowly growing pain, painless mass, I think um, the literature pretty much supports uh, referral to um, a treatment center. Yeah, that, that'll, that'll leave some finite rate of, of you know, malignant lesions that have been inappropriately excised because I think we see it all the time. Um, do you have any, any Matt, is there any data? I, I know there's some data on what that um, rate is. Yeah, so I, I think that the, for the first question I asked myself, first of all, I think Alex uh, does a really good um, answer. I think that the question I asked myself when I treated tumor or, any, or do any type of surgery is can I, can I manage this? Can I take this patient through their entire experience, manage the complications? And if I can't, then I, I would refer that patient on to the surgeon who can. And so I think that's the question that can kind of be asked of the um, uh, practicing orthopedic surgeon. The risk of complications or the risk of an altered outcome from an uh, initial non-oncologic approach to sarcoma again, according to Macon's sort of landmark articles, up to 12 times higher. And that can include the, the um, inability to perform limb salvage. And so in general, any tumor over three centimeters that's deep to the fascia, I would recommend referral to a, a sarcoma center, even before the biopsy is performed, because that biopsy needs to be conducted in, a, in an appropriate way to avoid complicating treatment. Does that... I'm not sure we answered your question. Yeah, no, that's, that's, I think it's actually a, a great answer, the combination of both of your answers. I know Dr. Lack, if he's still on, had a question for you. And if anybody else has a question, just speak up or use the reactions uh, box to put your hand up or just write a question in the chat box. Is <coughs> Bill, Bill thanks. Still here? Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Um, yeah, I would echo Howard's thoughts about how that was an excellent presentation um, by both. Um, one one comment I had, Matt, I really was you know interested in your talk about you know your previous research and interest in the patient's experience and understanding um, and how we deliver information to the patient with respect to amputation or limb salvage surgery. And I was just going to mention there might be an opportunity between you and one of the researchers at the VA because they developed a decision support tool at the VA that initially was kind of evidence-based based on, you know, uh, risk of certain levels of amputation going on to higher levels of amputation and discussed limb salvage or um, preservation of a longer limb, for example. But they've gone beyond that to include videos of the patient experience. So it's both a physician and patient tool. And so they're, they are recruiting patients who are going through the um, limb salvage versus amputation 
um, discussion and then using those videos to incorporate into a tool that they um, are sharing with future patients. And so I just, it's kind of in the same vein and I just want to mention it. I think it's really good what you're looking at and um, other people are, are looking at it here, so. Yeah, awesome, yeah. thank you. Well, yep, that's something we should definitely explore. Um, yeah, it, it will, maybe you can pass us along the contact information. Yeah, and it's also an opportunity for Dr. Brinkman to to uh, be the bridge between the U and the VA. Yeah, and it also sort of falls into one of our our overarching. I think Dr. Roberts has a comment, but one of our overarching research themes right now, which is to look at the survivorship of the sarcoma patient, um, trying to really explore the functional impacts immediately post-operative at the intermediate term and long term following limb salvage versus amputation. Um, so I think that would fit nicely into our goals. So I'd definitely be interested in learning more about that, Will, and, and uh, collaborating on that. Yeah, I'll share that right after the talk. And thanks again. Thanks. Dr. Roberts, did yeah. you have a comment? Yeah, no, I, I was just kind of, um, I, I thought that was a, a great and sort of broad, but also very focusedly scientific talk about soft tissue sarcomas. Thank you. Um, I would agree that that's a good sort of fits into our research arc of, of functional outcomes, post-operatively survivorship, as well as surgical decision-making. Um, but I think because you covered so many topics so well, I was going to ask you kind of a, kind of a broad question, um, which I think there's a, a lot of components of sarcoma treatment that are pretty stagnant, but at least it seems to me that there's some really potential for improvement um, in the sort of intermediate term in soft tissue sarcomas. And I was wondering what, what you think are sort of really the areas for improvement, whether that's immunotherapy, hypofractionated radiation, um, intraoperative surgical imaging, what do you think is gonna change most in the next five years in, in uh, management of soft tissue sarcomas? I, yeah, I would, I, Matt, I would just um, add to that, that as you were speaking, I was thinking the exact same thing uh, that, that Jesse um, asked you and felt it was a pretty broad question, but it's remarkable, you know, how the, um, you know, big advances in taking care of sarcomas sort of happened, you know, decades ago and, and the improvements have been extremely in incremental since then for all the reasons you asked. So I, I, I think uh, Dr. Roberts asked a great question. Yeah. So I think, you know, looking to one of the points you made, hyperfractionated radiation may be more efficient for patients, maybe easier for patients to travel to a tertiary center over a short time frame and receive treatment. Whether or not that impacts overall survival or risk of metastatic disease, I think is probably not likely. I think that's, you know, radiation and surgery are a local control measure. But hopefully, with finding an approach to hypofractionating radiation, we can make treatment more convenient and more, more um, palatable for patients. I guess I'm pessimistic about um, addressing systemic uh, disease risk. Um, for the reasons I mentioned, I think sarcoma is so heterogeneous. I don't know that we're gonna find uh, checkpoint inhibitors or, or, or find a really positive impact of immunotherapy. I think there's been some promising work done. I think that we've also seen some uh, through our involvement in trials, maybe some less promising outcomes of combinations of immunotherapy and radiation. Um, so I actually like that idea that I presented, the, the SIVO or the uh, technology where we're injecting chemotherapy directly into the tumor in the environment where it needs to work and just looking empirically at whether or not it works or not and, and potentially using that to risk stratify patients and select our treatment algorithms. I'm interested to see where that work goes, but I don't think that's something that's going to evolve quickly. Um, so I wish I had more optimism, but you know, maybe, that, maybe that magic bullet or that marker is out there, um, but mine's greater than mine, we'll find it. I think from a surgical perspective, one of the things we're interested in, and there are a few centers that are interested in this, is, is fluorescence guided surgery. We talked a lot about margins because that's the one thing in our control. And I, I sort of feel like definitely not all of our surgeries, but a high proportion, maybe up to 50% of our tumor bed re-excisions or close margin scenarios could benefit from fluorescence guided surgery where we administer a molecule intravenously to the patient pre-op and then try to detect uh, the fluorescent wavelength to identify the tumor relative to normal anatomy. I think there are other potential exciting technologies around that using ultrasound and photoacoustics to detect that fluorescent signal that's underneath muscle or even a thin layer of blood because fluorescence guided surgery is inhibited by tissue impedance. So the fluorescence signal only travels so far through uh, skeletal muscle. And so maybe we 
Maybe we'll find better ways to gauge our margin thickness or to identify a small sarcoma in a difficult anatomic location. Um, unfortunately, because of the reasons we talked about, we can only impact outcomes so much with surgical intervention. Local control is only part of the picture. Um, and, and so, I don't know, maybe, maybe I would turn the question back over to you. No, I think that's, that's an appropriately guarded response. Um, I think we're all, we're all hopeful for a chemotherapeutic magic bullet through or, or, or immunotherapy and, you know, where there's been success in other fields, there hasn't been in sarcoma with, yeah. with few exceptions, maybe just in intract fusions, but yeah, like continuing to do the work is the only way to do it, but there's nothing dramatic on the horizon as far as I can tell. Yeah. IDH, PDL1. I mean, there there are some indicate. I mean, we've since we've seen some dramatic responses to targeted therapies, but those mutations are not prevalent in sarcoma. So when they are, we're happy, but we've got a lot of work to do as a as a community. Are there any other comments or questions for Dr. Higgins or Dr. Thompson? No. Okay. Well, thank you again. That was a really wonderful talk covering a, a broad topic. And I think you, um, I think the relatively few questions that were asked reflected what a great job you, you both did uh, covering this. So thank you. Everybody have a, a great week. Stay safe. All right. Thank you. Thank you.